some explanation. So I would say all of the rest of the ones you mentioned is fundamentally a transaction. Mm -hmm. uh, you download a game, it's like a, 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 a song on iTunes. It just uh, download it, the, the, the content, you own it, you can play it anytime you want for as long as you want. The free-to-play model is a completely different beast. And uh, it, it it's not brand new, by the way. It originates in Asia, of all places. Uh, and mostly because uh, the penetration of ownership of uh, any uh, game playing device was very low. Mm -hmm. So the way that people used to play the game was to go to an internet cafe, uh, rent the computer for about a few hours, play, and then go home. But at that point, that means you don't own the computer, you can download it on that. So the only way is you pay for what you can consume. So th those are called virtual goods or digital goods. <coughs> the way it works is fundamentally the game comes for free. There is uh, some components of the game that are usually relatively scarce. In part, you can earn them by playing the game. But in, in reality, the economy is, of the game itself is, is built in a way that that element will always be scarce. New ones will be introduced. And so for you to be able to take full advantage of the game, you have at some point to buy additional components. So on one extreme, you have the, the famous Ville games, right? like Cityville or Farmville, or the equivalent, obviously, on, on mobile, in which you customize your world. You expand it, you extend it, you create uh, new ways to uh, produce a means of supporting your own economy and so on. On the other end, there is more action-oriented games. Uh, shooters or uh, uh, driving games and so on, in which uh, you can buy weapons, you can buy, for example, um, uh, the, the, the health kits uh, and that type of stuff. So fundamentally, the way the game works is, in, is uh, coded so that after a certain amount of time, you either buy more time to continue to play mm -hmm. or you buy additional elements of both. And so there is a so-called virtual economy based on uh, some synthetic currencies so no real dollars, so there is no actual transactional money. The only time that you do that is when you buy packages or packs of uh, virtual coins in the App Store or Google, uh, the Google uh, Play. Uh, so, and the way you make money is that you give Apple or Google about 30%, actually 30%, you give 70%. As Eric was mentioning, is at that point you have to pay for everything that supports the game, whether it's content or additional features, and what is left in your pocket at that point uh, is, is your earnings. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, Jefferson, you're launching a game. So how do you make, are you gonna make money with that game? Uh, <coughs> it, uh, so the thing that fascinates me with games in general, uh, and it, it's even more true now, is like how things change uh, a lot and they keep changing, and also how they're different in different countries. So, uh, you know, uh, so I'm releasing a game now, which is um, like a strategy battle game, uh, and then like we, we so we have to do uh, several considerations about like you know in the U.S. Uh, if you do the game in a way that people can just pay their way to the top, that's seen as cheating, and it's such a it's a very negative thing. And we're working on like a big uh, EA brand like called Dragon Age, you know, like for people who know that, but like we're so we're that there's a lot of gamers who expect a certain thing from Dragon Age, that if you come in and do this kind of thing, there's a bad reaction, which can mean that the game's actually not going to work as a business. Whereas if you go to Asia, that thing is seen as completely normal, and you're like, why you guys make such a big deal out of this? I just paid, you know, because I want to beat that guy, and that's fine. Uh, so it, 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 it's kind of interesting, like, that we had to do PR, like, here in the US, you know, meeting the IGN and all these companies, and it's like a big question to question, like, is the game going to be paid to win? Are you going to be able to win? And, you know, we actually designed a game in a way that it's not. But it, it, it almost doesn't matter how much you say this, you think it is, and, like, it, because there's such an ingrained, like, in the, in the hardcore culture, like, that, that, that you know, th these games are all to steal your money. Uh, they'd much rather just be doing $60 ahead than, like, to get this thing for free, which is kind of, like, uh, Again, I'll, I'll give the Brazil example. Like in Brazil, it's completely the opposite. Uh, where people are much rather get something for free, and because you know they're gonna get it for free anyway. Because even if you charge sixty dollars, you're just gonna copy it in, a, in, a, in the corner. But uh, it, free to play works so well in Brazil because uh, Brazil has like you know obviously it's a developing culture, so we have people with no money at all and people with a lot of money, and that's kind of how free to play works. Like there's a lot of people who like they come to your game and you know they might like it but you know, not enough to kind of make a financial commitment. And there's other people who 
realize after we're late, oh, I've been playing this the whole weekend. I really have fun, and it's not a big deal actually if I spend five dollars because I already spent so many hours on this. So it's a it's a it's a little bit more aligned with your time. Like I think if if, if a game becomes part of your like your week, then you're more willing to spend money in it, and then you know. But like again, there's, there's a small fraction of people like we mentioned here, numbers like five percent. But the, uh, the the key is that those five percent, even those five percent, is more like a curve. So there's people we're going to spend like a dollar, and there's people we're going to spend way more. Uh, like way more, like if you, I'm, I'm, if you guys want to guess, like how, how how much money do you guys think that you spend on this money? I'll bet, like it, it's not going to be half what I know, so like it or a, a tenth of what I know. So like there's people who spend a lot of money in these games, and that's kind of why I, it's kind of democratic in that way too. I mean, if somebody really likes a game and want to give it that much money, that's another thing that the good games do is like they design in a way that they can actually take all the money somebody was willing to give to you. Whereas, like in a, in a traditional model, if, even if I really, really, really like Call of Duty Ghosts, I can only give them Activision sixty dollars. Whereas, like in these models, like if I really, really like a game, and I happen to be the son of an oil, like a sheikh in the Middle East, like can actually give two thousand dollars to the game, and and the We've game. We've seen will... that all the time. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. Eric, Eric, do you, <coughs> I, I don't know, but do you think you can? You know, the concept of LTV is, is, is you think something that, you know, we can explain, like, like you know, how sure. today we have to calculate, you know, well, okay, if I have 5% of the users who are going to give me some money, and then a tenth of a 1% is going to give me $100, sure. uh, and then that's my revenue, and then I have to spend money on acquisition, because I have to bring users, I have to show my game to users, and that, that, that's, you know, so I have to spend money for marketing to acquire them. So how does that calculation work? Sure, so I think that's actually a, a really good point here. So uh, if you look at the, the free-to-play games, uh, and we're not doing free-to-play games, so I'm, I'm not necessarily the, the expert in the room here, but if you look at that, typically people will get anyone from 1% to 5%, maybe 8% if you're extremely successful and you're on the PC rather than on mobile platforms to actually part with some money after they started playing the game for free. And you depended on that 1% to 8% people to make all the money. Uh, and uh, you're spending money, the, the, the game is really a service, meaning that the way you're going to get people to go beyond the free stage is by making them want to spend money because there's things they're going to want to do with the game that either for practical reasons, because their time is more valuable, or, or for just plain uh, pay to win reasons, they, they've got to buy. Uh, and that means you've got engineers and you've got graphic designers and so on who are creating content. Uh, and the other thing is because you only get 1 to 8 percent of your customers that are paying, you need to make sure that you keep having a large influx of customers. Now, the, the nice thing about free-to-play is anyone can try it. The bad thing is because anyone can try it, anyone can release a free-to-play game. So there's, there's literally hundreds, if you take a platform like the iOS platform, there's literally hundreds of new free-to-play games coming out every day. Okay? So the barrier to entry initially is very, very low. That doesn't mean that everyone can succeed, most people can't, but, but that creates some issues which means that you need to keep feeding the machine by acquiring those users. Um, we, we are the other extreme of that, of that calculation. Where, so so the, the lifetime value of your customer, the amount of time your customer is going to play the game really matters because you only get a chance to get him to spend some money while he's playing the game. And a lot of those people, and that I can tell you firsthand, because even though our games, we sell them, on the iPhone, we have version of Ticket to Ride, we sell for $1.99. And a couple of times a year, we go free. So for like a day, we make it free instead. And what's really interesting is it's an online game. The value of that game is in playing against other people, because the, the beautiful thing about board games, compared to any other type of games, is the enjoyment comes from a very simple set of rules. It's got to be simple because most people play the physical version. They can't do a lot of math in their head. That won't be fun. Okay? So it's the interaction of the very simple set of rules with other human beings playing the game. So when people download our games online, they play it online. So we know exactly when they download the game, whether they play it or not. Okay? And what's very interesting is when you go free, so when you go instead of from 1.99 or even 99 cents, you go down to free, you increase your download numbers a lot. So we'll go free for a day and we'll get 150 downloads in one day versus a thousand downloads on a day where we pay it. But out of those 1,500 people, there's actually very few that are going to make the effort of learning the game well enough 
and we're talking super simple games. I mean, we're talking a game where the rules would fit on a train ticket, okay? And I mean uh, a subway ticket, a really small ticket, okay? There's like three different rules. It's not that hard. Most people who download the game for free won't go through that, okay? So the numbers look huge, but the money you get out of that first set can be pretty small, okay? Which brings us back to the lifetime value. We, we completely at the other extreme with our cardboard board games. We sell games for $50, okay? The only thing we care about is making those games the most desirable games possible. And if you succeed in doing that, the price doesn't matter. We used to sell for $40, we increased the price to $50, and the sales went up. And they went up by a large amount, okay? If you, it's something in the book business when you think of it. If you're the writer, if you're J.K. Rowling and you wrote Harry Potter, okay? It doesn't matter at what price you sell your book, okay? Everybody's going to want that book. And the fact that there might be the Lord of the Rings outside there doesn't change anything to what you're going to sell. Okay? So we're much more, I, I guess we're much more a traditional business. We, we look at the lifetime value in terms of generations. So we know we can only sell you the game once until you use, you've used it up. And we've been in business for 12 years. We're beginning to see that replacement business. So for the last two years, we've had people that bought a new copy of Ticket Ride because they played the physical version of the old version so much that just like for Monopoly, they, they used it up. Okay? And the beauty of that is then you don't have to worry about platform because cardboard is cardboard is cardboard. It doesn't change for several hundred years. Uh, despite 3D printing and all that stuff, I don't foresee it changing in the next hundred years. Okay? So you have a game that you design once. The only thing we revise in the game is every year we, we open the graphic file of the box and at the bottom of the box there's a small thing that says copyright 2004-2012. And then in January, we open it, we change the 2 of 2012 to 2013, we send it to the printer, and we say, please print us more money. And every <laughs> year, every year for the last 12 years, we've been selling more copies than the previous year, because it's purely based on word of math. So for us, the business, we view it very much like the, the car business, and I assume there's a lot of uh, uh, Italian car generals in the crowd. Uh, I'm a big fan of Ferrari, personally. Their cars actually don't cost that much more money to make than a General Motors car. But they can sell them for a lot more money, and that's, that's kind of our business model. Okay, so we are, I, I hope that you know, it was uh, interesting and that uh, you guys learned something uh, fr from us. Um, if there's a question, we have time, we have 15 minutes for, for a question, if, if you guys are, you know, want to interact with us or, yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. Thank you. Hi. Thanks. Um, how do you think uh, the next disruptive business model will look like? Going beyond free to play. Yeah, that's a very good question. Somebody wants to. <laughs> well, it's a very tough question because the free-to-play is not, it's not intuitive. So if you think of it, there is not an evolution of the way we used to make games and sell them. So, you know, I think that there is going to be a lot of, it's easier to think in terms of disruption as far as, uh, uh, for example, game models, gameplay models. I suspect that it's going to become even more granular than what it is today. So right now, for example, you get a game and you want to buy new uh, vegetables to grow in your garden, you pay for, for that. I think it will, the, the, it will become much more in terms of uh, the number of services that you're going to get. How uh, you can move uh, potentially virtual goods from game to game. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, it's not allowed because of the terms of service of Apple, but we are going to see some of that stuff. At the end of the day, Eric is absolutely right. It's a, it, it sounds uh, like the Wild West. In reality, there is a little bit of a method to the madness. So in other words, it's not like you're making a game that, that sells well uh, as a free-to-play game. It's absolutely, how can I say, random. There are some rules. It's difficult to know how well or how bad you're going to make. But I think that we'll, as we'll see, us understanding more the, rule of, more the rule of engagement with consumers, we'll be able to iterate on those and, and probably do a better job at engaging, and that's where the new models are going to come from. Now, disruption can take several forms. I think, in part, they're going to be dictated by technology, wearables, 
or is that going to do to games? It's difficult to tell at this point, right? We are seeing forms of gamification that impact, for example, health and fitness uh, applications. Can somebody make a game that is based on that type of things? At the end of the day, though, the thing that I think uh, free-to-play has uh, that it, it will stay with us is the transactional element of your relationship with the user. So fundamentally, you're not paying anymore. That's what I don't remember whom called it, the game as a service. Fundamentally, you don't pay anymore for the property. You pay for the transaction. That model will continue to exist. And it will continue to exist because I think it makes a lot of sense for the users. Users love that model because you can try a lot of different things. And uh, you don't have a game that you can take home, like in a box, uh, like, for example, what Eric's company does. So the sense of attachment to, to that, it's just not there the same way it is. If people want to try different things, and brands have not taken on as much as they uh, do, for example, in console games, or in board games, or in books. So I think that the disruption will come from marketing, the way we understand the consumers, the way we reach consumers, the way we um, create a more interest in our games, and the way the number of transactions uh, and transaction efforts will probably change. Yeah, if I had to guess, just from a like, consumer perspective, one thing I would really like is if like, there was like, a more direct connection between like, the people who make the thing I like and myself. So like, instead of, you know, we had the pay model and then we had free to play, and it kind of swing on one way, swing on another, and I think We'll probably go a little bit more to the middle because I think actually depending on what you have, like you know, if you're J.K. Rowling, you don't need to give things for free. You just you really don't, because people are willing to spend a lot of money, right? And uh, and I think uh, there's games I like, and I'll give an example like Metal Gear Solid, which I bought every single game that came out, like from that. Like I would, I would much rather if like I could strike a deal with them, like okay, I'm gonna just send you guys a check every year for like hundred bucks. And whatever you guys make, you just send me. Doesn't like doesn't need to tell me. Just send me on the post. Like I'll get it. I'll play. Uh, so I think, it, but but I would not do that with everybody, right? So like I would do that with, with like something, some someone who already proved that there's somebody I like. And a lot of people do that. Like bands are moving in that direction. Like you know, like Radiohead. You know, like just building like this very direct relationship with their, their fan base, etc. And I think that uh, you know that's maybe one way where the business models are going. Or or I know for a fact that people can. You know, start making that work today, and like really build a community around themselves, and you know, build a relationship, and uh, generate like a long-term business out of that. So it's really tough question. I think that uh, predicting the future is a good way to to look stupid in hindsight. So I kind of love to do that. Um, on on the product side, I think it's it's really tough to product uh, to to predict. It's clear that mobile is here to stay. Uh, and mobile is going to get even more mobile or wearable or, where, or whatever you want to, to call it. Uh, I think at some point in the next 10 years, I would bet we're going to see some interesting new things in terms of input methods. So the way you can actually control the games and interact with the games. Uh, on the business side, I really feel like we are on, we, in the free-to-play arena, we are on where we were in the uh, dot-com arena back in 2000. <coughs> In the next 18 months, my prediction is you're going to see an enormous, gigantic amount of free-to-play companies running out of cash and disappearing. That doesn't mean the free-to-play model doesn't work for some people, uh, but free-to-play will end up going back to a, a more reasonable level where some people can make money from it, uh, a few people can make lots of money from it, but uh, but what you've seen in the last year and a half, I'm absolutely willing to bet, and I still have some friends in the venture community back from my days as a VC, uh, is an aberration that will self-correct. So if you're not in the free-to-play business, hang on tight, and just the same way that brick and mortar companies didn't disappear after the dot-com boom, uh, you'll be doing just fine. Hmm. You better add something, maybe. You better add something. Uh, I, I like to look at the industry. There's two ways that it can progress. Um, one is by making it always more immersive and more interesting for, for, for these hardcore gamers. And often we focus on that aspect, but there's also, you know, how can we extend it even more and make game even more accessible uh, and have these small bits, you know, small moments of play that can happen. <coughs> so if you know from game developer today, or I start my game company, I think that these were the two aspects I would look at. One really, how can I, I can make it even more casual, and I think that the wearable will offer opportunities, you know, to create other types of gameplay that doesn't ask for a lot of immersion. 
Another way I think that you can look at the world of Warcraft and these really huge collaborat collaborative game, and I think that there's a lot of learning to learn there. I think that you see a lot of models that are coming up where people collaborate together through the mobile platform or, or, or to, to, to solve problems, and you see that working really in a really, really powerful way in the MMOs in these multi-player multi, uh, environment. And I think that we're gonna see application of that outside this virtual world into the, into the real world um, through uh, collaboration. Yes. Um. Hi, um, you talk a lot about um, uh, models that can be applied or are really close to the mobile gaming market or kind of gaming market but what do you think about the new console like uh, Obuya or uh, Steambox is changed something because it's changed the context it's not the mobility it's, it's a tone mm -hmm. uh, can you continue my exercise <laughs> <coughs> uh, to, to be clear I think Obuya is a, console, is a is a mobile device right so today it's it's built as, a, as an Android device. It's just a sitting static. You can put it in your pocket. In the form factor, such you, you couldn't. But if you take one of these or any other tablets and you actually connect it in a way that is meaningful and fast to a larger screen television, you have the same exact thing. So I think in, in part, uh, frankly, I think in the future we, we're going to see fewer consoles in terms of dedicated devices that only play games. And we'll see much more devices that are fundamentally just uh, uh, Swiss Army knives, where uh, you can do multiple things. Uh, one thing I suspect that you'll see connection between devices, so chain of devices. So you might have a phone or a controller that connects uh, wirelessly to, a, um, for example, a tablet that then can connect wireless, wirelessly to, to your television. Voice input, a la Siri, will become uh, a reality that will control multiple elements of that chain. So I, if I were, a, 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 again, a, a, an investor right now, I would definitely not invest in consoles. I can tell you that. Yeah. So I actually uh, am one of the uh, initial investors in Uya. Oh. Uh, <laughs> now, I'll put a bit, I'll bit, I'll put a bit uh, disclaimer that I didn't invest uh, because I felt I was going to make a lot of money. I invested because I wanted to disrupt this industry. And I feel these guys had a chance to, to shake people up. Uh, we'll see how it plays out, but uh, the reason I put some money is because I felt it was a rocket ride. Whether it goes to the moon or explodes in midair is still to, <laughs> still, still to be seen, I think. But uh, for sure, I'm enjoying the ride. Um, so that's, um, that's maybe a different perspective. On, on the Steam box, uh, I think that Microsoft made the mistake 10 years ago of underestimating uh, someone that used to work for them, who is now the founder of Valve. And I would advise other people in the industry who work for Microsoft or work for Sony, uh, I hear from some people who should remain nameless today, who were totally dismissive of the Steam box. Uh, I'd be more careful and I'd, I'd wait to see what happens. I think it's an interesting initiative. Uh, I can't claim it's going to be a success. But uh, Valve does one thing better than any other game company in the world right now, which is understand their gamers really, really well. And I can tell you as a developer, if other vendors and other, uh, other uh, gate uh, people or people that had platforms behaved in a way that was as developer friendly as Valve is, I think they gain a lot more traction with developers. So we'll see what happens. But at the end of the day, what makes platforms successful is games that people really want to play. And from that standpoint, I think the Steam Box has, a, has actually a much bigger shot in the living room than, a, than most people, both in the industry and in the analyst world, are willing to give it credit for. We have time for one more question. So, um Something I hear a lot and something I heard on this panel is that we are not yet a mature industry even though we've been here for almost 50 years. I would like to know, uh, I would like to hear from you guys um, how would you define what a mature industry is and what, um, what, what does the video game industry needs, needs to do to be considered mature? What are the steps we're not taking? 
well, it should be mature, it would be boring, so, so I wouldn't be there. But, um, <laughs> Jefferson, do you want to take this one? Yeah, from, from my perspective, it's just, I, mean, it, I think it's just the amount of change. Like, you know, there, there's, there's always like something coming up and, and changing the way things were, and you got to rebuild everything from scratch. So that kind of stops you from actually, you know, having methods that you can rely on for like 30, 40, 50 years, like a Hasbro or like, in, in, like those guys, right? So like it's a, it's a little trickier because like you're literally having to, like I said, the, the change that EA is going through or like, has gone through in the last few years is rip off all the marketing and publishing, like rebuild it all again because it's completely different. And it's gonna happen again in a couple of years. So like it's, it's always happening. Like there's always new, new platforms, new uh, Western world, Asian, like uh, sometimes Asia, like people ignore Asia and everybody's like hot about Asia again. And like it kind of goes back and forth and suddenly you gotta have an office in Asia and you gotta be there, you gotta go to China. Like it's just like too many variables, I think it's changed all the time. It's really hard to, to you know, build do something reliably when everything's changing underneath you. I don't know, that's my, my perspective anyway. Yeah, I think uh, I doubt that the video gaming industry will mature because the underlying platform is a technological platform and I don't see technology maturing, at least not in my lifetime, and I kind of don't care about what happens after I'm gone. <laughs> um, so I doubt that the video gaming industry will mature. Uh, and also, the other thing is, uh, to me, a sign of a mature industry is in the, indeed an industry that is boring. Uh, and I'll be the first one to testify that I've uh, been in the board game industry for over 10 years. It's boring after a while. Uh, but boring doesn't mean it can't be very profitable. Uh, and I'm really happy the video game industry is there, because that's the one part of our business that keeps me interested. It just doesn't happen to be the most profitable one. So, uh, my deepest hope is that the video game industry doesn't mature. Uh, that's true as a participant in that industry, and that's also true as a video gamer. Thank you. Can I ask uh, two questions? I see a show of hands of people that have a different perspective on games now after this panel and have learned something. Right. And of those people, are there any elements that you've learned tonight that you see that's made you rethink about your own business outside of gaming? Okay, great. Thanks. Can we have a big round of uh, applause for the speakers? <laughs>